as a, a child, my parents put me in piano lessons, just as, you know, any good Avenus parents do, it seems like. And uh, so they put my, myself and my two siblings, and we began taking piano lessons. And we took them for about four years, from about the age of eight till we, we left uh, Southern California till about when I became 12. And uh, what was, you know, very interesting with the whole, the whole piano thing is you begin and you don't really like it at the beginning. You think, why are my, are my parents making me play the piano? And then you begin to enjoy it a little bit more and a little bit more. Uh, as you go on. So you, you go home, and after, after school you get home and you would uh, practice piano for an hour every day. And so we did that for three, four years. And at the, end of the ye- at the end of the year, you would have a piano recital where you would come together and all the other students would come and you would be able to play a song or you would hope you could play a song in front of so many people. Well, I had, I had a friend, Derek, and Derek decided that he was going to play piano too. And so he started taking piano lessons from the same teacher, and we would go to class together and uh, get instructed on how to pay, play the piano. We would go at, um, right after each other, one another. And uh, I had this, I was very excited. I had a friend that was taking piano lessons with me. And so that was really, really great. Well, it gets to the end of the year, and as you're getting to the end of the year, you're practicing that piece, you're making sure you know, your fingers are, are curled just a little bit, your, your back is straight, you know, you don't sit at the back of the piano bench, you sit a little bit towards the front there, and you're, I'm making sure that my piano piece is just perfect so that when I play this, this piece at the piano recital, everyone will just be, wow. That guy can play the piano. That's that, that was my hope. That guy can play the piano. And, and so I, I've been practicing for, for hours and, and, and weeks on end. And the day finally comes. And we, we pull up to, to the house where the piano recital is going to happen. And Derek is there. And, and I'm thinking, man, I'm going to blow this kid away. You know, my friend is just going to be, wow, you play so well. How do you do it? And so I, it's my turn to get up and walk up to the piano bench. And with every, you know, everything's shaking. You're like, I don't know if I'm going to do, if I'm going to remember all the notes and everything. And I begin to play. And I play, and it's perfect. Let me tell you, it was the most perfect piece that I had ever played. I'm not saying it was the most perfect piece that had ever been played, but it was my most perfect piece. And so I played this beautiful, beautiful song. No idea what it is, but, you know, it was, it was wonderful. And so I, get, I, I finish, and it is even throughout the whole thing. It's not too fast or too slow. It's just, mm, it's just you know, it's, it's just, you, you want to memorize it. You want to put it into the, the Piano Hall of Fame for Dominic Alipun, not, not the big Hall of Fame, just for me. And, and so I sit down, and I'm thinking, that was an excellent job. I did, I did perfectly, right? Derek goes up to the piano bench, and he begins to play his. And I'm listening, and my ears begin to drop. And I notice that there is no way that I would be able to play something this good. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, hold on a moment. I've been playing for four years. And he's been doing this for how long? One year. How can he do this at the end of one year? And I realized something. And that was that he was way out of my league when it came to uh, being a musician and a a piano player. And I I, I realized that I probably should stop. So I stopped. I I haven't played the piano since I was 12 years old. And uh, that wasn't the reason. We we moved, and our our piano teacher decided to stay where she was. Um, And uh, so, but, you know, sometimes, have you ever been in a place where you realize that I am out of my league. I shouldn't be here. I remember, you know, we often, uh, we like to go out to eat every now and then. We don't do it very often. But when we do, we like to uh, stake out the place a little bit. And one of, I remember we were walking somewhere. I think, I, I, I can't remember the place that we were walking. We're walking down in, in, this, in this town, maybe this city. 
and we saw a Japanese restaurant, maybe Ashley knows it better than I do, and we were like, hey, we should go eat in there and eat some good Japanese food. And so we looked in the windows to make sure if it was too up to you know, high class. We got a little girl and you know, often people don't like um, their food thrown at them. And so we uh, wanted to make sure that it was an appropriate place to bring a little girl. And we thought, you know, we could probably make it happen. There's not a lot of people in there. And so we go in and there's you know, business women and heels, and they got their, their, their work suit, right? Their, their pants suit on. And there's, there's men, and they got their laptop, and they're making deals and calls over the phone while they're waiting for the waiter. They bring their food, and we're thinking, oh no, where did we end up? We, st- we, we end up eating there anyways, but we were still wondering, oh no, um, are we supposed to be here? Have you ever been in a place where you thought, I am, I don't belong here. This is, oh, I don't know. I, I just don't belong in this kind of space. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah finds himself in a place where he's thinking, I don't belong here. What, what am I doing in here in this place? And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Isaiah chapter 6. And that's going to be the focus of our message this morning. Isaiah chapter 6. And as you're turning there, we'll go ahead and have one more word of prayer. Father in heaven, this is the place that we're supposed to be, right here at this moment, because not because of the, that this is church, not because that there are lovely people in the chairs sitting next to us, but because we are in your presence, and that's where we need to be. Father, we just ask that your words through the prophet Isaiah will ring true in our hearts, and that we can focus on the message that you have for us, the message that is beautiful and wonderful and true. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah chapter 6 opens up with these words, in that year, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. What happens when the king dies? There's a scramble for power, right? David, you remember King David, he's on his deathbed and Bathsheba's coming in and didn't you promise that Solomon will be king? And so he begins, he gets Nathan together and Solomon and Bathsheba and they're about to make him king and they hear the sound of trumpets. Someone else is trying to be made king, right? Abijah, I can never say his name right. Uh, He's trying to be king and there's Zadok the high priest. And they got their own trumpets. And the big question, well, who's going to end up being king? Is it Solomon or his other brother? Right? There's a scramble for for power. doesn't matter if it's a Jewish king or an emperor or a president. Whenever there's someone, a, a leader dies or there is a transitional period, the big question is not, will we get a good one? It's, will we get a bad one? Right? Because what will the bad one do? Well, put in bad uh, policies and go to war against wars we shouldn't be involved in, all that kind of good things. And so the big fear that Isaiah and many of the, of the, of the kingdom of Judah are, is on their mind is, the king has died. What's going to happen next? What, what's going to happen to our country? What are we going to do? Doubts, uncertainty, all those nasty things begin to settle in. And it's in the year that the king has died that Isaiah goes into vision and he says, I saw who? The Lord sitting on a throne and it's high and lifted up. While the king of earth has died, the king of heaven is on his throne. Oh, if there's nothing else you hear this morning, I want to let you know that the king of heaven is on his throne and he's high and lifted up and there's one thing that you can trust and that is that God is in control there's things that the the presidents and emperors and rulers and prime ministers of our world don't know and there's but you know what the the king in heaven he knows all and it says his robe fills the whole temple every place that Isaiah went he encountered the presence of God he could see the robe the train of the robe of the king 
wherever he went. Verse 2, and it says, Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had how many wings? They had six, two that's covered his face, and two covered his feet, and two with which he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You begin to see that the place that Isaiah finds himself in is a place of majesty, a place of awe and wonder. The, the seraphim, we often think that they're, they're angels, right? We often combine the seraphim, the cherubim, and the angels all together, when in reality these are very distinct groups of people, of, of not people, but individuals that are probably very, very different. Uh, whenever you find the, word, the, let, the two letters M at the end of a word, uh, it is, means multiple, it means plural. It's kind of like our S or ES, you know, boxes means more than one, right? And we know that because of the ES there, and that's the same in Hebrew with the IM. So the, that core word, that root word of seraphim would be seraph, seraph. You know what seraph? It's, it's used in many places in the Old Testament, often with the stories involving snakes. The word seraph means fiery ones. It's often translated as fiery ones or serpents. So I want you to imagine here, Isaiah is in the throne room. He's in the temple, and, he, and the throne is above him. It says it's high and lifts it up. But even higher than the throne, you have the fiery serpents with six wings. And they are above the throne, and they're crying out, Holy, holy, holy. This is a strange environment. This is weird, this, but it's also holy and beautiful and majestic. Verse 4. We're, we're, by the way, we're, we're not in the story yet. This, Isaiah is just describing what he's seeing. This, this is what it looks like. This is what church looks like. And the post of the door, or your translation might also say the thresholds, or the, the foundations, the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with what? Smoke. There's this, this aspect of mystery in the temple. Verse 5, this, this is, verse 5 is Isaiah's response to all of that. Imagine, if you were in a place like this, how would you respond to the smoke to the flying serpents, to the voice of God speaking, and everything is shaking. With his words, there's an earthquake. It's, it's a scary environment, right? It is, it is, is not, this is not a, you know, a cathedral. This is not a, a nice little church. This is, there's, there's, there's things happening in this place. Notice how he responds. And I like how it says in the ESV, I'm reading from the, King, from the New King James, uh, which says, woe is me, for I am undone. The ESV, or the English Standard Version, says, woe is me, for I am lost. And he's, he's definitely lost. He's thinking, I, I shouldn't be in this place. I, I, I am out of place. Why does he feel lost? Why does he feel undone? And this is the reason. He says, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people. He says, and I, I recognize that it's not just me that is sinful and I'm, in, I'm, I'm part of a, but I'm also part of a group of people who shouldn't belong in this place. I feel uncomfortable. I feel out of place because of my sinfulness. There's this great little song. I think it's in Isaiah. Um, but I don't, I can't remember if it's, a, you know, sometimes you get mixed up with the song happened in Isaiah or in uh, the book of Psalms. And it's, it's the mountain of the Lord. And it says, uh, come, let us go up. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. And the big question in the psalm is, who can ascend the hill? Who can ascend the mountain of the Lord? Those who have clean hands and have clean clean lips. So he says, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, 
the Lord of hosts. We went to a small school. At least I thought it was a small school. Probably in Oklahoma, probably isn't as nearly as small. We, I went to Ukiah Adventist uh, Junior Academy, uh, and we call it, it was UJA for short, Ukiah Junior Academy. And uh, we're at the 10th grade, and there were um, many classrooms where it was just me and one other person. <laughs> and we were, uh, I remember my geometry class. It, it was myself and my friend Kristen. We were the only ones in, in that geometry class. And one day she got sick, and I was mad because then it's just me and the teacher. And I, I didn't want it to just me, be me and the teacher. And so I, I pretend to get sick the week later and um, just to get back at her, you know. And, um, but we, we had uh, sports, little sports teams, and we would play the same team, the same school every year. And so there was this other school, Redwood Avenue Academy, and we played them in every sport, and that was the only team we played. And so we became, you know, good friends with those other kids. And uh, so because of that, we, our, our basketball team for the school, we only had about five players one year. I remember we had five players. You know how many you're supposed to have on a, on a court at a time? You're supposed to have five. And so we would show up, and every one of us would play every single second of the game and because we, we went to a tournament once, so it means you play multiple teams, right? And we had five players, and all of us played every minute of both, both of those games that we were there. And so it was a small school. And so uh, on, on those basketball teams, I, I prided myself as a, as a good basketball player. And of course you are in a small school, right? And, uh, but then we, I left that school, and we went, because I only had, we only went up to 10 grades, and went to Rio Lindo Avis Academy. And began, and they had tryouts. I was like, "Whoa, they got tryouts at this. You have to actually make the team." And so we went to tryouts, and I was, I was happy I made the team. And then, but then something happened that I realized that I was nowhere near as good as I thought I was. And that is, we had a, a basketball uh, a, a player, a, a student. His name is Anthony, and Anthony was related. Let me tell you again, he was related to a basketball player in the NBA. He's, he's related, right? So that means uh, he can go and talk to him and say, hey, help me with this, help me with that. And we would match up against one another. We're the same height, but, we, but the skill level is very, very different, let me tell you. And so he could do things that I, you know, I, I watch on the, on the TV screen and, you know, and, and say, wow, I hope I could do that one day. And this guy was just out. Of, I, I thought, man, I, I am just nothing. I'm this little, little peanut compared to him. And uh, he probably thought so too. And, uh, but, but we became friends and there's something that happens when you are in the presence of greatness, right? There's something that happens when you're in the presence of greatness. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's basketball or if it's cooking or if it's, you know, um, Woodworking, it doesn't matter. I got a friend um, who's a pastor in this conference who he just loves to do woodworking. And I, I like woodworking too, but for me it's like a hobby every you know few months or a couple times a year. For him, he does it all the time. He does like epoxy with the with the tables and he puts things inside and make it look like it's it's his whole world. And he puts he built this table and I come to his house, I'm like, whoa, how do you how do you even have time to do this, man? And but he, when you're in the presence of greatness, there's something that happens. You realize, oh, I, I thought I was good, but now I realize that I'm not. And that's what's happening with Isaiah. He's, before this, he probably thought he was pretty good. But when he's in the presence of the Almighty, when he's in the presence of God, he's like, whoa, I don't belong here. But notice what happens. He feels uncomfortable. He feels like he shouldn't be there. Verse 6, remember those seraphim flying, those fiery serpents? It flies down to him. Can you imagine what's going to happen? There's a, a big serpent with six wings, and he's built out of fire, and he's flying towards, oh, what's going to happen? Why is this serpent flying towards me? It says, one of the seraphim flew to me, and having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. The altar, this is probably the altar of sacrifice. Uh, if you remember what the altar of sacrifice was, that's where you go to offer your, your sacrifice for your sins, and your sins were, were cleansed as you made that offering at the altar of sacrifice in the sanctuary. And he takes a coal from that place, and it says in verse 7, and he touched my mouth with it. 
Remember? He says, I'm a people of unclean lips. He touches the place where he feels unclean and sinful. And he says, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Some, some translations will say your shame or your guilt instead of iniquity is taken away. And your sin is purged. Your sin is atoned for. Now, something happens in between or right after verse 7 that is completely different from what has happened before. Because Isaiah is a different person in verse 5 than he is in verse 8. This is moments later, and something has dramatically changed. Because remember, at the beginning of the story, he enters into God's presence as, oh, I shouldn't be here. Let, 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 let me find a way I can hide. I, I, I'm, I don't belong in this beautiful and weird place. But in verse 8, he hears a voice. He says, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And the person who jumps forward at this question, at this request, it's not the seraphim who live and work and operate in the presence of God. It's not the cherubim, that the covering cherubim in, in the sanctuary that work in the presence of God, who Lucifer himself was a cherubim. It's not the messengers. The word angel means messenger. This is why in you know, Revelation chapter 1, and Jesus tells John to write a letter to the churches of Ephesus and Thyatira and Smyrna and Sardis and all of those. He doesn't say, write to the pastor or to the elder or the church leader. He says, write to the angel of Ephesus and, you know, all those different places. Well, how do you write a letter to an angel? You get your, get your pen, you write the address, the realm of heaven, 777 Holy Way, next to the Tree of Life, right? No, the, the, word, angel, the word angel in Greek, which is angelos, means messenger. That's all it means, messenger, which you, all the angels that we see in most of the stories, that's their role. Gabriel is a messenger to, to Daniel, to, to Mary, and to many others. And so that's their role. One of the messengers want to jump forward at this request and say, hey, that's my job. That's what I'm supposed to do. Here, God, I'll come and do it. It's not the messengers. It's not the angels. It's not the seraphim. It's not the cherubim who jumps at this request. But who is it? Isaiah, the one who felt uncomfortable and out of place. He's the one that jumps forward. In verse 8, he says, here am I. Send me. There's, there's no, hey, we need to go and do this. He, God doesn't say what, you, what he wants you to do, Isaiah. He doesn't tell you where, you where he wants you to go. He doesn't tell you what he, he wants you to say, not yet, until verse 9 and verse 10. Without any of that information, Isaiah jumps forward. What has happened between verse 5 and verse 8 that now Isaiah is jumping at the opportunity to do what God has this is an open invitation. This is not, Isaiah, I need you. This is, hey, anyone, who, who can go? That's, that's what God is asking. This is open to everyone. And Isaiah jumps forward at the opportunity to do God's will. What has happened to Isaiah? How, what, what has happened to his, 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 his personality and who he is that now he is jumping forward at the opportunity to do this. When you are in God's presence, there's something that happens to you. When you are in God's presence, there's something that transforms inwardly among you. You know, it wasn't uh, the, the apostles after Jesus goes up and ascends into heaven and he tells them, you're going to go and go to all the corners of the earth and baptize and make disciples. They didn't get a seminar by an angel saying, this is the way that you preach. This is the way you give Bible studies. This is the point one, point two, and point three, what you're supposed to do. But they have an encounter with God for 10 days. They dedicate themselves to prayer and the fasting. And they have an experience of God 
Moses has lots of reasons not to go back to Egypt, right? He says, I, I don't have, I, I'm not eloquent of speech. I, I, I stutter, right? And I, I can't do all these things. I'm just, I'm, just a, uh, I'm just a shepherd. You want me to go talk to the king of, Fair, of Egypt? That's crazy. Where's the army behind me? Jesus, or God, he doesn't know Jesus' name. Where's the army behind me? None of that. But what does God give the disciples, the 120 believers, and Moses, and Paul, and you? He doesn't say, I'm going to change you. He says, I will be with you. Because guess what? That's all that you need. That's all that you need. Right now, you are in the perfect position to do God's will. Of everything that you are. You are lacking in nothing. It's not about, I, I need to know more. It's not about, I need, to, I, I need to know how to give a Bible study. It's not, it's not about any of those things. It's not that I, I'm, not, I'm not brave enough. All you need is God. That's all you need. Because if you have God, there's nothing that's bigger than Him. There's nothing that's going to destroy you. There's nothing that's going to be, you can say, oh, you know what? I, I only have this little thing called God in my back pocket. And everything else is too big of an obstacle. Ah, oh, man, if, if I only had something bigger than God, man, I could, I could do great things if I had something bigger than God. Isaiah has had an experience of God. He's been radically transformed. He hasn't been changed, but he has been transformed because the very presence of God has revealed something in him. Something beautiful. I wonder, what would you see? What would you see if you could see God seeing you? What would you see if you could see God seeing you? Would you see him giggle? Would, he see, would you see him laugh? Would you see him planning? What would you see? Would you see him sad? What would you see? If you saw God seeing you. Here is the, the crazy bit of all of this is that Isaiah is in a place where there are people, there are individuals far greater than himself, right? Yeah, that, that, those seraphim, those cherubim, those angels, we can say they are far more holy. They have never experienced sin. They're far more able to accomplish what God needs. But the crazy part is not just that Isaiah says, here I am, send me. The crazy part is that God is fine with it. Right? Because you imagine you're, you give a big call. Let's, let's say the President of the United States, whoever you want to be in that picture, he gives a big call and says, I need someone to go and do this task. Right? I need someone to go and accomplish this mission. And people start signing up. What would be the selection process for that individual? Would it be the first person that says, hey, I, I want to do it? Probably not, right? Because let's, let's be real. There's some weirdos out there, right? There's some strange people. Not everyone, we would like to say, hey, yeah, you should do that. You should accomplish that goal, that, that task for the president. What, what, what would happen? There would be a screening process, right? At church, we have screening processes, right? I'm not going to say that you guys are weirdos, because I, I, I think you guys are all, all wonderful. But we still have screening processes, right? If you want someone to care for your children, you're not going to be like, hey, the first person that signs up, let them have it, right? Because it's an important task. But in this story, there's no screening process. And that should be crazy. Aren't there better people? than Isaiah, of all people, to go and do whatever God needs him to do. God is not just fine with you, but God has chosen you. God has chosen you. What would you see if you could see God seeing you? I think of... Um, I, I know I, I get in trouble for this because uh, when we were at camp meeting, I was with the teens and we were uh, you know, doing different things and I would speak every now and then. 
And I, I mentioned my daughter, because uh, you know, my daughter and my wife, uh, I love talking about them, and they're a big part of everything that I do. And uh, one of the, the, the girls there at, in the teen department, they, uh, you talk about them too much. Talk about something else. But, you know, um, I, I think about the way I, I view, as, as a father, the way I view my child, and um, how there's times that she surprises me. There's, I remember there was, there was a time, you know, as she's getting older, she's only two and a half, but when she was, you know, one, there was things that we were trying to get her to do. And now at two, we don't have to get her to do those things because she's grown and, and done different things. And um, she goes through phases where she says certain things more, more often than, than others. And so the, the newest thing, you know, she says is, oh, that's cute. That's cute. She'll say, that's cute. And she always does it with a picture of herself. She says, that's cute, you know? And, um, but as, as a father, I see lots of potential in her. I can see what she can become. I can see what she could accomplish one day. And even with her, her little personality and the things that she loves to do right now, I can see where that, that can take her. I want you to imagine what your father in heaven, when he looks upon you, does he see potential in you? Does he see the things that you could become? Things that you could accomplish? I believe with all of my heart that God has big things in store for you, whether you are two or 92. Whether you are two or you're 92, that you still have potential and there's things that God wants to see you do and accomplish. And the biggest barrier is not an obstacle out there. It's not, I don't have enough money. It's not, I don't have enough skills. It's not that I don't know enough of Scripture. You know what the biggest barrier is? It's yourself. It's, it's being willing to say, okay, God, I'll go ahead and do that. I'll go ahead and follow you wherever that's going to be. Well, determination, that's, that's a, it's a good one. Uh, but even stronger than determination is just you saying, okay, let's, let's do it. Okay, let's go. Because the, you know, one of our biggest fears is the fear of the unknown. The fear of the unknown. But I want you to focus on, on something greater than the unknown. The thing that you know. The thing that you know. And you know that God, not only is God good, but God is kind. You also know that He's powerful. You also know that He's strong and He's merciful and He's willing to walk slow and He's willing to walk fast and He's willing to cast down all barriers ahead of you. Focus on the thing that you know that the one who is leading you is not a slave driver. He doesn't carry a whip anymore, right? Just had a whip in the, turning over the tables. But we have one who is kind and loving that wants to see you grow and do amazing and wonderful things. And that he has planned for this building and the people in it to not just preach and have Bible studies and have Sabbath school and have good food. That's, that's not the end goal of the church, but the church's function and, and, and purpose is to reach people that don't know him and say, hey, there's something beautiful you've, you haven't encountered. This, that God is not, you know, I, I, I want to share just this last thing with you. Um, there's this preacher who, who shares how he went to uh, a barber shop and he's getting his hair cut. And uh, the, the lady who's cutting his hair says, uh, and what do you do? And he finds out that he's, he's a pastor. And, and so he says, she asks him, well, do you believe in God? And this is like a silly question to ask a pastor, right? Do you believe in God? And for a moment, he's going to answer, well, well of course. Yeah, that, that's obvious, right? Um, but he, he takes a moment and he realizes that's not really the question. And he says, well, no, I'm actually an atheist. And, and she says, wait, what? How, you, you're, what do you mean? You're an atheist. He said, well, well, I'm an atheist who believes in God. And he's like, what, what, what do you mean? Because here's, here's the thing. There are people 
all over the world who may or may not believe in God, but they have an idea of who God is. Even atheists have an idea of who God is. And he begins to tell her, well, tell me the God that you don't believe in. And so she gives a description, right, of, uh, you know, how can God be good and loving and there's, you know, children being, you know, um, hurt all over the world, not getting food and diseases and earthquakes, all those different things. And then he says, well, what if, well, tell, actually he says, tell me the God, tell me a God that you would believe in. Describe a God that you would believe in. And so she starts to describe a God. And he says, that's the God that I believe in too. That's the God that I believe in too. And they begin to have a wonderful conversation. You know, there's, there's something about, about God that is actually very, very beautiful and wonderful that most do not know. Most know that, you know, there's going to be a, a destruction, there's going to be a judgment and, and all that, but they don't know about the beauty of God. Tell people about the beauty of God that you have experienced and that you know about. Allow them to be transformed and captivated by his beauty. And then everything else will follow. Father in heaven, thank you for the fact that you look at us with, with awe just as much as we look at you with awe, that you see your, your children who can grow and become beautiful, wonderful people. And Father, we just want to, at the end of the day, say, after we've been transformed in your presence, we want to say, yes, I will go. Send me. Send me. I don't care where it is. I don't care where it is. Send me. Because at the end of the day, when you come and you can say, what have you done? We can say, this is what I did, Lord. You, you told me to do this, and this is what I did. And these are the people's lives I've touched. What if we could, we could meet in at, the, at the pearly gates and we can sit at the table of the, the wedding supper of the Lamb and the person next to us could say, I'm so thankful you're here because of what you did, because of what you said to me, because of how you introduced me to the God of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.